death. The great equaliser that comes for us all, and despite being very painful for those who care for us, many of us often don't go out with a bang. I've really been enjoying doing compilations of interesting or stupid things that aren't big enough for a full video, so let's discuss some deaths that have been remembered throughout history, not because of heroism or sacrifice or anything noble like that, but because of sheer stupidity or just plain bad luck. Strange and Terrible Deaths Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Fume. Fume is an award-winning device that is all about helping you break your bad habits in an innovative way. But breaking a bad habit doesn't have to be an uncomfortable or drastic change, so Fume is here to remove the bad from the habit. Instead of using electronics and annoying people with giant flavoured clouds, Fume is completely natural and instead uses flavoured air. Not only is the air flavoured, it is made using all natural, delicious flavours that contain no harmful chemicals. So, Fume really is all good with none of the bad. You can simply enjoy your habit guilt-free and replace your old bad habits easily. Your fume will come with an adjustable airflow dial that is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers something to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your bad habit. After trying the new fume flavours myself, I was honestly very surprised at how flavourful it is. It feels very fresh and the moving parts are great for helping to fight stress. I've been feeling great since using it. Stopping is something that we all put off because it is very, very hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. And you can upgrade your journey pack to the Solano to enjoy the premium walnut barrel and onyx black coated mouthpiece that has a smoother finish and still get yourself a discount. So, join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com slash dankula or scan the QR code on the screen and get an amazing 20% off site wide running from now until December 1st. And after that, you can still use my code to get 10% off. So that's tryfume.com and use code dankula to save an additional 10% off of your order today. We will start in the year 612 BC. Charondus was a well-respected lawgiver in Catania, Sicily. He was known for writing out his laws in verse, which would be more impressive if they weren't laws. One law that he had issued prohibited weapons from being brought into the assembly. The charge for bringing in weapons was death. These very harsh laws were for some reason very popular with the public, since harsher punishments usually meant fewer criminals. However, one day after hunting in the countryside, Charondus entered the assembly forgetting that he had left a knife on his belt. The man didn't want to be a hypocrite, so in order to uphold his own law, he took out the knife and committed suicide in front of everyone. I mean... Never, never let it be said that the man wasn't principled. Another story in the not-so-far-off year of 622 BC involved another lawgiver, but this time in ancient Greece. The Athenian people were extremely displeased with their laws and called for a reformation. So, the people appointed Draco, also known as Dracon, as their first legislator, enabling him to implement a written legal system. Draco was extremely harsh on crime. Even small petty offences were charged in a similar manner to major ones, meaning that the death sentence was a very, very common occurrence, and a petty thief would be charged in the exact same way as a murderer. Also, this is where the term draconian comes from, to describe unfair or unforgiving laws. 
But it turns out that Draco's harsh punishments brought crime down massively. Not just because they were killing off all of the criminals, but seeing the death penalty on the horizon was a pretty good deterrent for any potential wrongdoers. The people approved of Draco and his laws so much that when he made a stage appearance at the Agenetan Theatre, in typical Athenian tradition, they threw clothes at him. They threw so many clothes at him, in fact, that he was buried by them and he suffocated to death. <laughs> of course, the Athenians uh, later realised that Draco's laws were very immoral and very unfair, and in the modern day, we would deem them as cruel and unusual punishment. In Austria, in the town of Brunau am Inn during 1567, there was a popular mayor called Hans Steininger, and if the name of this town doesn't ring a bell, it was the birthplace of a certain quirky moustache man who would eventually fly the windmill of peace, but this video isn't about him. Uh, Hans was very well known for having a glorious four and a half foot long beard. Uh, <laughs> He had, a, he had a very, very big beard with a fort tip. And on most days, Hans would actually roll his beard up and hide the rest in one of his pockets. But on the 28th of September, 1567, a fire had spread throughout the town. Hans was on the scene trying to calm people down and get everyone out safely. During the panic and all of the hurry, his beard had come loose from his pocket and was trailing along the floor. Unfortunately, while he was escaping, Hans actually tripped on his beard at the top of a large flight of stairs, plummeting all the way down them and breaking his neck. So, the man's prized beard is what actually killed him. Before his funeral, though, the people of the town actually carefully cut his beard off so that they could put it on display in a glass case at the town museum. In the Orkney Isles in Scotland in the year 892, Sigurd Einsteinson, Einsteinson, I don't know how you pronounce it, fucking Ein, are you hanging around the shitting log, fucking hoogie boogie Nordic names, uh, also known as Sigurd the Mighty, the second Earl of Orkney, famous or infamous from the Norse sagas Heimskringla and Orkneyinga, had defeated Melbrishta Tusk or Melbrishta the Bucktooth in battle. Mail the Bucktooth was a Pictish nobleman from Mori, and it turns out there was a very good reason for Mail to earn the name Bucktooth, because apparently his teeth were absolutely disgusting with decay and all kinds of other diseases, and they protruded from his mouth like a horse. He was essentially the Pictish Ken Dodd. The Pictish nobleman had grown very tired of Sigurd and all of his men sailing over to mainland Scotland from the Orkney and Shetland Islands and performing raids in his homeland. Instead of having an all-out war where hundreds, possibly thousands of men would die, the way things were settled in Scotland back then is each side would bring 40 of their best men, and whoever won the fight won their terms and the other side had to honour it. But Vikings being Vikings and not really caring about things like Scottish customs or honour, Sigurd actually brought 80 men to the fight, whereas Melbrishta had only brought the agreed upon 40. So, while the Pictish noblemen did put up a great fight against the Vikings, they were easily overpowered because they were so outnumbered. Sigurd did, however, take part in one Scottish custom, and he took Melbrishta's head as a trophy and mounted it to his horse's saddle. Because that's something we used to do back in the day, we were headhunters. We would walk around with heads attached to our clothing to show everyone how badass we were. Basically, back then, if you wanted pussy, you better have a few heads on your belt. No heads, no head. He and these men would ride very long distances while in Scotland, raiding from place to place, and I'm very sure that Sigurd considered himself very fortunate. Although, one thing started to bother him. The protruding teeth of Mel Bridgeta had been rubbing against his leg while he was riding, enough for the friction to actually cut into his skin. Since this period wasn't exactly known for its cleanliness and hygiene or its dentistry, it was very, very likely that good old Bucktooth had all kinds of oral diseases, which caused Sigurd to develop a fatal infection and die. 
In some of the older stories, apparently the head came to life and bit Sigurd in the leg, but I think it's more likely it was just rubbing against his leg while he was riding. But you could say that it ended in a draw, or that Mel Bridgeter had the last laugh. Since Sigurd had actually broken his oath with the nobleman, it's no surprise that he ended up with such a terrible fate. The Roman Emperor Valerian apparently spent his last days as a prisoner of the Persian king Shapur I, after he had suffered a massive defeat and lost 70,000 men during the Battle of Edessa. With a lot of history, there are many different stories depending on the source that you use, but it is thought that King Shapur kept Valerian alive in order to humiliate him regularly using him as a footstool or keeping him in a very restrictive cage so that he withered away and couldn't sleep. The king enjoyed having someone who was once emperor as his prisoner and plaything, since it made him feel powerful and grew his ego. After experiencing an unbearable amount of torment, Valerian actually pleaded and begged, even offering his own money as ransom to Shapur to buy his freedom. The offer was turned down, but the offer itself actually greatly insulted Shapur, and despite the fact that Shapur wanted Valerian to live the rest of his life being tortured and shamed, this insult was enough for Shapur to sentence Valerian to death. At this point, death would probably be seen as a blessing compared to the life of suffering that Valerian would have had to endure. And it was seen as a blessing until the method of his execution was revealed. There are two versions of this execution, and both of them are horrific. The first method was that Valerian was to have molten gold poured down his throat, likely as an ironic or poetic ending to someone who was once an emperor. You know, a crown for a king and all that. The second was a much more brutal death. Valerian was to have his skin flayed while he was still alive. Now, you may think he would have gone into shock and died from that, but any torturer for a king likely had a bunch of tricks to keep you lucid and awake throughout the entire process. But it doesn't even end there, because after Valerian's death, Shapur ordered his body to be stuffed with straw and then mounted as a trophy in one of the main Persian temples. Meaning that even after death, his humiliation continued. Kensal Green Cemetery in London started in 1833, which makes it one of the oldest cemeteries that is still around. It's full of extravagant sculptures and headstones, some of the graves have their own little gardens, and some even have small perimeter fences. You don't really see cemeteries or graves like that these days, which gives the place a kind of charm. And despite the fact that it is a place for the dead, the place has a lot of history, and I imagine that it means a lot to many generations generations of people. But we aren't here to talk about nice things, and one incident that happened in Kensal Green Cemetery certainly wasn't nice. A 60-year-old man by the name of Henry Taylor worked at the cemetery as a pallbearer. For those of you that don't know what that is, those are the guys that help carry the coffin from the hearse to the site of the burial. In the 19th century, a lot of wealthy people would order massive, expensive, lavish coffins that had multiple heavy layers of materials and gold and all other kinds of metals that would end up making the coffin weigh up to a quarter of a ton, compared to the modern day where you're just getting a Pinewood box, pal. Also, for the record, eh, when I die, I would like to be cremated, then I would like my ashes put into a cannon and fired at Hamza Yusuf. But anyway, the rich wanted to show off their class and wealth, even in death, which, as a side note, just made them pretty ripe targets for grave robbers. Henry was very used to carrying all manners of coffins each day, and the morbidity of the job was old news to him. Except for one day, when he and the other pallbearers were dealing with an unusually unwieldy coffin. They carried it across wet, slippery grass with no problem, but on the rest of the way to the burial site, Henry tripped on a stone. In order to save themselves, the other men let the coffin go. But in doing so, the entire weight of the coffin landed directly on Henry, specifically on his chest and jaw, which ended up killing him. 
there's quite a bit of irony around being killed by a coffin. On the 2nd of November 1872, the incident had actually been drawn in the illustrated London News, and it was advised by the courts that straps were now to be used around coffins to prevent future events like this one. In Vilna in 1891, which is now Vilnius, Lithuania, a local bear had grown a taste for vodka. So, to feed its habit, it broke into a small village tavern and stole a large keg. The tavern owner was absolutely furious since this probably wasn't the first time that this had happened. He objected to the theft so severely that he grossly overestimated his strength and ruggedness. He wanted to make the bear pay. This would be the last time that this bear would steal from him. So, he made the extremely smart decision of trying to wrestle the keg from the bear. He was immediately mauled to death. Also, this isn't the end of the story. It gets worse. It gets so much worse. The bear had broken every bone in the man's body and also caused some very severe internal injuries. Then it smacked him around the bar like Bam Bam. When the villagers later arrived at the tavern to relax and have a nice drink after a hard day's work, they came across a massive, drunken, sleeping bear surrounded by empty kegs and body parts. Because the bear hadn't just killed the tavern owner, it had also killed the tavern owner's entire family. Franz Reichelt had moved to France from Wegstatel in the Kingdom of Bohemia, Austria-Hungary, which today is the Czech Republic. He opened a dressmaking business which became quite successful and he mostly catered to Austrians who were visiting Paris. But in his time off, he used his tailoring skills to create his super secret invention. Franz arrived at the Eiffel Tower at 7am on the 4th of February 1912 with all of his friends and a bunch of reporters in tow after he invited them all to come and witness his amazing invention. A parachute suit. You have all probably seen this video before, haven't you? But anyway, the police were informed and permission was given to show off this invention. Now, while any sensible person would use a crash test dummy for something as dangerous as this, our Franz was no bitch. So, he got into the parachute suit and he was going to do the jump himself. Franz climbed to the first balcony of the Eiffel Tower and he stood on the edge waiting to jump, breathing in the cold air as he gathered his courage. The news team had set up a camera to actually watch him jump and then another camera at the ground level to see the landing. And what a landing it was because after taking one last final deep breath, Franz performed the jump and his suit completely failed and he hit the ground like a ton of shit and he died instantly. Why am I laughing? That's not funny. Bobby Leach was a circus performer and daredevil and was the second person ever to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. He performed the stunt on July 25th, 1911 and he suffered two broken kneecaps and a broken jaw as a result. He didn't stop at just Niagara Falls either, he also wanted to swim the Niagara Whirlpool Rapids. His first attempt was a failure and so was his second and his third attempt, each time having to be rescued from drowning by a river man named William Redhill Sr, who knew Niagara Falls very well and became very well known for for his rescues. Bobby had survived amazing stunts in the past, but this one was just too much for him. Though he likely would have tried again since he had an endless amount of enthusiasm to succeed, but unfortunately he died from slipping on an orange peel. Now, you might have heard the daredevil orange peel story before, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. He actually died from complications due to an amputation surgery which he needed to have because an injury that he gained from slipping on the orange peel had developed gangrene. So, technically it was the orange peel that did it, but it was also the gangrene and the surgeon fucking up. But, I mean, think of that though, you survive some extremely deadly stunts just to get killed by fruit. Now for an event that affected very many people and it began in Strasbourg in France in July of 1518. A local woman named Mrs. Trofea took to the streets and began dancing. 
And by the end of the week, another 34 people had joined her. Now, this wasn't some kind of public show where they would return the next day. They had actually been dancing non-stop for days. The local authorities did not know how to handle this event and they didn't want to cause more panic, so they actually encouraged the people to dance with even more vigour, even setting up stages for hired musicians in the hopes that everyone would stop once they got too tired. This, however, did not work. In fact, it just made the problem a lot worse. By the end of the month, 400 people who were mostly female were reportedly dancing non-stop in the street. Each day that passed took the lives of around 15 people due to malnourishment, dehydration, exhaustion, strokes and heart attacks. They actually named this event the Dancing Plague. Anytime someone tried to intervene or stop the dancing, the women would not stay still. As the days went by, more and more of the dancers just kept dying until over a month later, they just suddenly stopped. As if the event had never even happened. And to this day, no one knows why or what actually caused this to happen, but the favourite theory is that the people had accidentally consumed the psychoactive fungus ergot, which can end up growing on wheat or barley that hasn't been stored properly. Other theories also include mass hysteria, witchcraft and Satan. During a funeral in a small Russian village, the coffin lid flew open and the corpse started to climb out. Now, this would shock fucking anyone, but since these people were remote with very little education in medicine, they were also extremely superstitious. So everybody scattered believing that a great evil had befallen their village. A zombie was on the loose. After running back to their homes, they locked and bolted the doors and windows and hid inside. Until, eventually, they gained the courage to band together to banish the demonic shambler back to hell. So, they armed themselves with guns, stakes, knives and any other weapons they could get their hands on to confront this demon. Forming a mob, they tracked this zombie down and they shot, stabbed and pummeled it until it stopped moving. After they were sure it was absolutely dead, they took its remains to a marsh on the outskirts of the village. After all, this was a creature of Satan and didn't deserve a proper burial. Also, historically, people were thrown into a marsh due to being poor, or as a punishment after death, or because the body was diseased. The village priest who had some medical knowledge arrived at the village much too late, since he had his suspicions that this wasn't really the work of Satan. It was actually a poor innocent bastard that had regained consciousness after being in a coma. The shambling and inability to speak properly were just side effects of waking up from a fucking coma. Oh, but he looked all pale and deathly, blah, blah. yeah, he was sick, he was in a fucking coma. But they killed him, so... Oops. Clement Vallandigham was a lawyer defending a man named Thomas McGeehan in a murder case during 1871. The case surrounded the death of a man during a bar fight. The lawyer was trying to prove that the man who had been shot had done it to himself as he was drawing his weapon from a kneeling position. But in order to do this, Clement thought that the best way to convince the jury was a demonstration. While he was at the Golden Lamb Inn, he decided to give some defence lawyer friends of his that he was having a drink with a preview of this demonstration, likely showing off to his colleagues by showing them something that would outright win him the case. The main problem which would cause anyone that follows gun safety to absolutely lose their minds was that he assumed that the gun wasn't loaded, instead of actually just checking it. So, as he stood up from a kneeled position, pulling the gun from his holster, it snagged on his clothes and he shot himself in the stomach. And he died from his injuries. The exact same way as the alleged victim in the case. This proved that he was in fact correct, but at the cost of his own life. Thomas McGeehan was instantly acquitted and released from jail. However, it seems that Clement's self-sacrifice was in vain, because McGeehan was actually shot and killed four years later in yet another bar fight. 
This death might be one that you've all heard of before and it involves another lawyer and a little bit closer to our time. On July the 9th, 1993, Gary Hoy worked in a 56th floor office building in Toronto and was extremely proud of the position he had earned at Holden Day Wilson on the 24th floor of the Toronto Dominion Centre. On the day of his death, he was showing prospective students around the office talking descriptively about everything to a boring degree. Upon approaching the floor-to-ceiling windows, he went on to tell the students how tough the glass was, even saying that it was unbreakable. But it wasn't enough to just tell them it was tough, he had to show them. Even if you haven't heard this story before, <laughs> you already know what's about to happen. He ran at full speed and threw himself against the glass, likely assuming that the students would be very impressed by this dangerous act. And he was right, the glass did not break. The glass was, in fact, very strong. But the seal around the glass was not. So the glass just popped right out of its frame with this fucking moron following closely behind it to the street below. Now, I'm very sure that it didn't take long for him to hit the ground, but there was definitely enough time for him to think to himself, I am an absolute fucking moron, before he painted the pavement. His death did, however, kill the company that he worked for, which at the time was the largest law firm closure ever to happen in Canada. In 1870, a wealthy Iranian woman bought a cat, and she decided that she loved cats so much that she would start breeding them. And, just like with most inexperienced breeders, before she knew it, the house was absolutely full with cats, and she had become much, much more than your typical cat lady. The cats would be spoiled with luxurious meals, likely much better than what her two maids had to eat. No one came to visit her, and the only people that did see her was the house staff. The cats became fairly unruly, some of them even became feral because they were left to do whatever they wanted, and there weren't enough people around to look after all of these cats. You can just imagine the absolute state and smell of that house, even with the maids around. One night, a fire started raging through the building, which sent the cats into an absolute frenzy trying to find any means of escape, but they all funneled into the same hallway. The woman obviously wanted all of her cats to be safe, so she ordered the maids to go back inside the house and free the cats. These maids must have been very scared of the homeowner because most people would have just said fuck that and ran the fuck out of there. But they did as they were told, but as soon as they opened the door, the cats just swarmed them. Like, you, ever, you ever seen World War Z? <laughs> right, picture, picture that but with cats. The cats just started mauling the absolute shit out of these two maids, and they mauled them that badly that both of them died of their injuries. In 1895, a factory worker heard one of his colleagues screaming. So he rushed in to help her, thinking something really bad had happened, because after all, this was an old factory. Even with new machinery, a lot of dangerous industrial accidents can take place. But it turns out that it was just the mouse that caused a little bit of a woman moment. Though, instead of getting mad that she had startled him, he was going to play the hero and vanquish this beast for her. He was clearly trying to impress her a little bit. After searching for a while, the man saw the mouse darting across the room, and somehow was able to grab it. He held it up and acted as if this was a huge victory, until the mouse escaped from his hand, ran up his sleeve, and then ran out the neck of his clothing. As he gasped in surprise, the mouse quickly ran into his mouth. He swallowed the mouse as if it was some kind of reflex, but the mouse now couldn't breathe. So, as it was travelling down his throat, it was scratching, clawing, and biting at him all the way down. And there was nothing anyone could do. The woman just sat there, watching this horror unfold in front of her, screaming her head off. The internal bleeding made it very hard for the man to breathe, and eventually he collapsed dead. Sometimes it's the small things that get you. 
John Sedgwick was a military officer for the United States Army during the start of the American Civil War. He lived and breathed the military and fought for the Union side. He had been wounded three times at the Battle of Antietam while leading his division personally, and he was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General for his service and bravery. On May the 9th, 1864, John spotted sharpshooters targeting members of his squad, including his staff and artillerymen. The sharpshooters were taking shots at them from over a thousand yards away. This expectedly caused a lot of the soldiers to panic and to take cover. John took this as an opportunity to show his bravery to his men and try to bring up morale. So, he started to march carefree in front of the sharpshooters with a jovial disposition. He shouted, Men dodging this way for single bullets, what will you do when they open fire on the whole line? He continued his marching without being hit once, which looked almost like a miracle to his men. He then shouted, They couldn't hit an elephant at this dist. Right through the eye, right through the fucking eye, died instantly. He was the highest ranking man during the Civil War to actually die on the field, and he was highly respected by his men. Apparently, even the President, Ulysses S. Grant, was very upset at the news of his death. Then again, it was a very comically timed end with literally famous last words. Now, this one does kind of end in death, but not in the way you would expect. Nicholas Ferrier was a tribule or court jester who was very well known for his wit and humour, and he would very often get into trouble with nobles, royalty and other people of high status for being a little bit too spicy. He had served under both King Louis XII and King Francis I. As some of you may know, it was very often looked down upon in history to punish a jester. And because of this, they could get away with a lot more than other people could. This was called the jester's privilege. Punishing a jester made kings and other leaders look like they couldn't handle the bants, which was seen as a sign of weakness. The same goes for countries. While court jesters could make mostly verbal comments, it was probably seen very differently when physical humour was involved. While serving King Francis I, Nicholas thought it would be absolutely hilarious to slap the king on the arse. The king was very shocked and asked him if he could be any more offensive. So Nicholas replied with, Sorry, I thought you were the queen. Nicholas was sentenced to death. <laughs> However, since he was a jester, the king allowed him to choose how he would die. And Nicholas responded with, old age. This amused the king since he really couldn't argue with the jester's logic, and Nicholas was granted his wish. It turns out the king actually had a decent sense of humour himself, you know, minus, minus the whole death sentence thing, although it's argued whether he was being serious or not and he was just trying to scare the jester. But one day Nicholas actually approached the king to tell him that a noble had threatened to hang him. To which the king responded, don't worry, if he hangs you, I'll have him beheaded 15 minutes later. Nicholas argued that it might be a bit more helpful if the king ordered the beheading 15 minutes before. I can't really argue with that logic. Don't go anywhere. You sit right there. I've got live shows coming up in London this December and you can buy tickets to them down below and come to see me. I've got a small show at Comedy Unleashed and then I've got two big shows later in the week. You can, you can come to my shows if you buy tickets in the links down below. For the four women who watch this channel, you can buy them as an early Christmas present for your man friend or boy toy or whatever the hell you've got. I don't, I don't know what women do. But still, come, come to my show and I will tell funny jokes and I promise I'll only be a little bit racist. Just a little bit. Just a little bit racist. But anyway, come come to my show. I want I want to I want to see you all in person. So I can fight you. It's count thank you on YouTube. Everybody subscribe.